Okay, it is 536 p.m. and I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, I would like to, um, we do have quorum. I do need to let you all know that this meeting is recorded and it will be posted on the PCPB website as well as our YouTube channel for others to view. So I just wanna let you know that. We do have to do some parliamentary, uh, some in-house business. So um, if you're not on the subcommittee um, or you're here as a guest, just sit back and then we will go ahead and go through um, okay. our, our stuff. So um, the first order of business is with the uh, meeting minutes. Um, I've sent everyone the draft meeting minutes. And is there a motion to approve? I make a motion. Motion to approve. I'll All right. second. All right. <clears throat> and then everyone in favor, raise your hand. All right, that's unanim unanimous. Okay. Is there any non-agenda public comment at this time? All right, with none, we'll go forward. All right, thank you. And so um, our first action item is a request uh, to possibly request a letter of support and advocate for the Mandy. preservation. Yes? My name is I interject. I think we have to approve the agenda. Can I make a motion to approve the agenda? Oh, sure, yeah, apologies, sorry. I, I got all um, excited, go ahead. I know, me too. <laughs> Can't wait to talk about trees. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. All right, thank you, Eva. Do I have a second? A second. Angela, all in favor? Raise your hand. Okay, well now let's get to why we're here tonight. We're here to possibly request a letter of support to advocate for the preservation of several palm trees that are located along the 4,400 block of Newport that are slated to be removed due to interference with the existing radar technology that's being utilized by the airport. And so we have with us today, we have John and Tracy Vandewalker. They are residents that live in the area. Um, this is a, a very hot topic. It's been in the news, it's in the local um, editorials and papers. And so we wanted to provide an opportunity for our community members to come before the environmental subcommittee and to advocate and present their issues with um, the current situation and potentially find a solution for this that works for the community members. Now, we are an advisory board for the city and we do make recommendations. And, and while we're here to try to find solutions, um, we don't have the final say in what the city uh, does. And so we want to do our best to um, communicate the issue and potentially advocate for these trees. And hopefully the city um, will listen to, to your concerns and, and help preserve these trees potentially. So um, with that, I'd like to um, share the floor and ask that John and Tracy come and provide a high level, you know, expo you know, just debrief of what's going on um, and how, what they'd like to see in that area. So um, you have the floor, go ahead. Um, I guess I sent out an email. I'm not sure who, if you um, had dispersed that to everyone. Would you like me to read that email out loud? Um, or? I could just briefly touch on sure. what um, occurred and how this became in the first place sure. is that on um, October 8th, well, a letter was dated on October 8th. Um, neighbors didn't receive um, these letters until either October 14th or 15th um, through the mail, and they were from the airport authority. And these letters indicated that they would be removing the trees within the next few weeks due to um, a certain code. I can't remember that exact code. Well, that's the title. The code led you to title 77. Mm -hmm. And per that title, it states that, um, you explain this part, you're better. Um, uh, have to be uh, 499 feet. Uh, 489 feet above. You're cutting out. Can you repeat that? 
anything over 499 feet AGL is a issue for the airport. Okay. And AGL is a uh, ground level, uh, you know, uh, ocean ground level. And so at 4404 Newport is 200.1. The tree is now 65 uh, feet. And uh, what happened is 77 referred to Terps, which we finally figured out. And Terps is, is uh, basically the ILS system for the airport. And with Terps, uh, their calculation said that it could not be 270 feet. And so in the equation, they said it was 265 feet and we do it every four years. And so therefore the palm tree grows 2.5 feet per year. It'll be over this specification. Um, ILS is a system for uh, basically horizontal and vertical for airport guidance to the airport. Um, it is, it was initially put in via the FAA 1964. So it is a really old technology. Um, it's line of sight. So the transmissions are strictly line of sight from the airport at two different frequencies from two different transmitters. Um, they were supposed to outdate it in 2019. Uh, GPS can take care of that problem, no, no issues. Um, ELORAN could be the backup for GPS, which is time standards, which are basically location. Um, this, the uh, airport is having a problem with 5G between 420, uh, 4 uh, 4,200 megahertz and 4,400 megahertz for the altimeters right now, which if you're working with GPS and uh, ELORAN and LIDAR, you wouldn't have a problem with that issue also. Go ahead, so, Christian. So you're saying the transition to the new system would negate the need to remove the trees because it's exactly. no longer an issue with the new technology. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So in short of that, um, but, um, this is what we found out on our own. Um, us trying to contact the city in the meantime, we had, again, we'd received the, the letters um, citing, you know, citing those titles and everything and tried to get, like I said, didn't receive them until Thursday night or Friday. Some of the people didn't re, um, receive them until Friday the, the 15th. So, um, we were trying to figure, and it only referred, it gave us a map with, with this letter. And the map only referred to the tree in front of your house and maybe a tree adjacent to your house. But then there's multiple other trees on the street that were um, set for destruction, but they didn't show those trees to the neighbors okay. that were down the street. So it was kind of the way we look at it, sneaky the way they did it, because they only showed that your tree was being removed or maybe one next door to your house was being removed. So all of us neighbors had started talking and had were trying to figure out who exactly received these letters and how many of us to, and trying to decide how many trees they were actually taking down. Since we um, received them on a Thursday and a Friday, trying to get a hold of someone in the city to ask them questions about these titles, these codes and titles they're giving us, and the reasoning why they're cutting us down and trying to get the FAA report for us to see, and just asking them questions in general, you know. We, we didn't, you know, it's the weekend all of a sudden. And then we have Monday. And so we sent out emails and everything to um, not only the airport authority, but we CC'd Jen Campbell, the mayor, um, 
you know, emailed them also personally on other house, trying to get as much information, but at every road we tried to turn to get information, no one would give us anything. No one would um, give us the, the actual report on from the airport authority stating that these trees needed to come down. Um, no one would really give us a good enough excuse because the codes, again, that they stated in our letters um, were, incorrect. were incorrect. And then oh. Monday comes along and trying to get all this information. Then they show up first thing on Tuesday morning and topped off one of the trees already. So that gives us one to two business days to try to figure out why, why they're doing this and try to gather information, which they're ignoring us and won't give us any. And then, and um, they came out and started chopping already without, you know, talking with, you know, conversing with any of, any of the neighbors, you know, giving us any reasons. And they, yeah. they had, um, well, they, again, they talked off the first tree and I started running up the street and asked for, you know, the permits or, you know, where's, where's the signage? Why didn't you put up any signage? Where's your permits? Where, you know, how come we weren't notified? And they said, well, we don't need permits. We don't need to put up any signage. I'm like, well, you know, I thought you were supposed to. And then they started down to the second tree to start topping that up. And that's when I started to stand underneath trees. And then, um, then they went to the next set of trees and I stood underneath those trees until they cleared out for the day. And then the next morning they came and um, first thing bright and early in the morning to start again, to cut down the trees. And luckily I saw them and ran up and um, stood underneath the tree again. And this time they had um, Brian Widener show up um, probably within, I don't know, 10 minutes or something, 15 minutes. So he was coming down already. And um, he's the head of the Department of Forestry for mm -hmm. those of you that don't know. And he had told me that, um, you know, obviously since I was problematic, that they would be here the first thing the next morning, which would have been the Thursday morning, and he would bring police with them and they would cite me or possibly haul me off to jail. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, threat, you know, just in a threatening manner. So that's when I contact, tried to contact everyone I could um, to show up the next day. And that's when we kind of had a... Uh, yeah, he said it was emergency. Well, that's what he was stating the next day. Yes. That the reason why, well, and he told me that day, actually he could take the tree down whenever, any trees down whenever he wanted to, you know, mm -hmm. he could chop down any tree he wants to, whenever he wants mm -hmm. to, he doesn't need to notify anyone. And he made me wear that. He didn't need to put up signs. He doesn't need to ask permission. He just can take them down whenever he wants, whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the other issues that um, uh, I wanted to share, can you share the historical information about the trees and who, how they came to be? So um, the ones that do line um, Newport Avenue, the 4400 block of um, Newport Avenue, and then go ahead um, south all the way down Santa Barbara Street. Um, those two streets were actually the main thoroughfare, the automobile bill thoroughfare into Ocean Beach back in the day. Collier, which is supposed to be the father of OB, mm -hmm. um, DC Collier, he's the one that put in the trees to mark that um, main thoroughfare coming into OB. And this was, these were supposed to be put in around night, sometime mm -hmm. around 1909 to 1910. And so these trees are, approximately 110 years old, these palm trees. And how tall did you say they were? 
Well, So, say that again. Sorry. Um, he said that ours is approximately 66 feet okay. right now. And he said that the airport, their tolerance is anything above 70 feet. But they're, they're stating that these palm trees will grow 2.5 feet a year, mm -hmm. which if they were to grow 2.5 feet a year and they're over 100 years old, they'd be over 250 foot tall. Okay. And they're not. Yeah. Um, so and they don't grow and they do max out at a certain point. They do max out and they they don't, you know, grow any. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have video also of um, an old video of a car <clears throat> coming down Santa Barbara um, towards our house because we live on the corner at 4404 Newport Avenue on the corner of Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara and Newport. And there's a car coming down videotaping and that was in 1970. And the from the top of our roof and where how much the trees are over our roof, that hasn't changed that much to this day. And that's 50, you know, 51 mm -hmm. years. I'm sorry. So now I have much. a question. A Angela has a question. Sure. Um, has right. anybody had an arborist go out and look at the trees to actually yes. let us know that they're not going to be growing any? Yeah, well, not, they height? can't say that they're not going to be growing whatsoever. They might be growing like less than an inch in that, you know, an inch in that amount of time. Yeah. And I mean, an arborist has spoken to you guys to um, tell you. Uh, Yes, uh, we had uh, an arborist come out and basically they said that you could hormonally, you know, put hormones in this and control the height of that. Awesome. If that wasn't mm -hmm. wrong. Hmm. Does, does anyone know, does the city use some sort of standard, for lack of better word, growth charts? Because it, it seems to me that the city is assuming continued linear growth. Um, past a certain, without regard of there being, you know, a certain max growth point, um, which if these are mature trees, you can't assume continued linear growth. Um, what, what are these, what are these growth projections ah. based on? Are, are there any, is there any sort of objective data? Does the city use no. parameters in terms of certain tree species and, and expected continued growth? Um, or is this some sort of just objective projection? There is actually, it's like in the, uh, the policies and stuff like that, they had two choices to do, either a standard growth rate of 2.5 or the actual. And so, of course, they picked the 2.5. Mm -hmm. But also, it would be a totally a mute point of the height of the tree if they updated the ILS system with GPS, mm -hmm. because that would not cause any interference. Also. Which they plan on doing anyway, and especially with this new airport, all the money that's going in there, mm -hmm. <laughs> that and would be you... one of the things they would do. So why would they cut down the trees now? Mm -hmm. And the reasoning behind that, obviously, are we think the reasoning mm -hmm. is, is that, um, well, greed for one, because they're getting money from the FAA to cut them down. And number two, um, they're tired of the upkeep of, of said palm trees. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and that letter you received, was there any mention as to whether they would actually remove the stump and at some point replace the tree? Or was they said that they would removal? replace the tree, but, but from what I understand, there's no removal of the actual stump. They might grind the tree down, but usually when the the city itself usually doesn't remove the trees, they usually contract out. But since they're, they're my assumption, and I'm assuming that the reason why that they're actually removing the trees themselves is because 
the monies are coming from the FAA, from the government. And if you don't remove the stump, it's not going to, and then there's not enough room to plant other trees. It's not going to be conducive environment to plant something else. Not, not I, until, would, I would like to. Not until, um, the, not until that stump breaks down enough to where roots for another tree can take hold. Palm trees do not destroy the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And okay. if you're going to talk about uh, leafy trees and et cetera, mm -hmm. hopefully you're considering about the sidewalk and the damage that might be. You know, you bring up a good point, John. You know, you definitely want to put the right tree in the right place. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen with Tory pines, you know, people put them out in front or they put a, a species that doesn't quite work for the space allotted. And then it creates infrastructure issues with the sidewalk. Um, or the road. So I agree with that. And there were a few questions. Um, I had a question about the stump removal. Um, I know that throughout the community that there are areas along the right of way that have been removed by the city. Um, is that standard practice uh, for that? And if so, what would the cost of that be? Is it just a cost thing? Is that why they don't remove them? Yeah, they do. They get to the point where they grind it down because actually removing the stump is very costly. It, it's, it's expensive. Super expensive. Yeah. Okay, and then um, perspectives maybe. Stumps. <laughs> and, uh, and matter of fact, on the side of our house, the city comes by and marks this stump every three years to take out. We've had this stump on the side of our house for 13 years, as long as we've owned this house. And before that, they've been marking this stump for 10 years prior, approximately. So this well. stump has been on the side of our house that they keep on saying they're, they're gonna remove for approximately 20 years. So I don't, I don't really believe in the city about them and any type of stump removal. Okay. So Mandy, did you want some advice from us? Yes, go ahead. Number one, if the trees are a certain height, they actually officially are in the FAA's authority to say you need to remove them. You need to ask for that, that uh, documentation. They obviously have a model, how tall it is, how near it is the airport. You need to ask for that documentation. Well, we have, that's the problem is they started cutting down the trees before and they wouldn't give us any documentation. Okay, let me, let me That's just, the problem. Let me, let me give you a couple points, okay? Then you can figure out what to do with them. Uh, again, I'm a professional forester. Got my degree in 1975, okay. So you deserve, we deserve the math and the model that says why. Mm -hmm. And then the answer may be, they gotta go. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, if, number, if, it's, if it's dangerous, we don't wanna right. keep them. Number two, you're in a lawsuit. I just read the San Diego Union Tribune article that's online. You can ask for some things that you might not otherwise get. And this stump grinding is extra money, but well within their ability to pay and well within their authority and obligations. So as, as a very, very minimum, if they are going to remove those four trees, they remove them, grind the stump, and then come in and plant a tree. Um, the, um, so those are, yeah, those are, um, I think the other thing is, is to make a point that the city doesn't just do it without it, proper notification. And I think that that's one of the changes that we have, you know, that, that needs to be asked for across the city. I'll tell you, it's largely because they don't have enough staff. And I've been pushing that for a long time. That doesn't mean that the city doesn't have an obligation to run an urban forestry program with an appropriate number of staff. So I think that that Brian should have had community notification, should have done that right. You can expect that. How he handled it personally, I can't comment on because each of us would have handled it differently. But I do think that the expectation for appropriate notification that that links to codes were correct, et cetera, 
our expectations that we have as as um as as citizens so whatever you end up with there's two levels to this number one is do you lose your trees number two is do you contribute to making this a community-based urban for urban forestry and palm because palms are not trees but they are large things in the in the um in the community are you going to contribute by what you demand to change the system so i'm going to my last thought will be that i work a lot with girl scouts and so we talk about what can you do a, individually to recycle bottles to use less to thrift to you know to eat meat etc but on the other hand look for a video called the story of stuff which says use less the other video from that platform says the story of change and the important part of that is that rather than saying i need to do less or i need to say something about this tree doesn't go down the point is that you are part of making a system change. So what demands that you make of the system may or may not change whether or not those trees are cut down because there is an FAA, assuming there's a realness to the FAA, but then you need to say, all right, talk to us, send us notification, have a meeting, whatever. And I think that's the, the change that you could contribute to as a group of people in Ocean Beach. You may have a different perspective, but that's mine. I would concur. But the problem is that all city officials and everyone will not come to the table or contact us. So therefore, this is why we are in court. That's okay. In court, you can get things that you can get when you're not in court. Yeah. But also, history. Uh, history, 110 years of history can, and by the way, I'm an Eagle Scout, so therefore. I'm a Girl Scout, okay? I'm an Eagle Scout. Gold How many bomb. years have you been a Boy Scout? I've been a Girl Scout for 60, since 1959, 62 years. How many years have you been a Boy Scout? <clears throat> um, last time I was in the Scouts was, gosh, uh, well, military officer. Not as many years as me. Okay, keep going about the Boy Scout thing. No, we're talking about history. Okay. Oh. History, 110 years. You know, and, and I think that's... Oh, you're a little... We can't hear you. They should be designated heritage trees. Well, that's a different process. Okay. Well, I know it is, but that's the, the thing is, is that they're historic trees. Someone there, they are um, attached to someone who is, of, you know, a historic fi figure within San Diego, you know, especially Ocean Beach. And you're talking about, well, let's get in some green leafy trees. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. If you're a biologist and you're, you know, getting in your green leafy trees it's not about that it's about them being historic can, can i can i interject anyway, it's about I, not I, I, those are my comments those so, are my pieces kind of places, Andy, for you there's a ton of places where that need to trees to be planted why do you have to cut these ones down there's a ton of places to plant trees okay. different okay. project different right. issue Thank, thank you tracy for uh your comments thank you and eva you had something to say um, you know, I, I, again, I think we need to get back to the, this is an environmental committee. And if you're looking at this purely from an environmental perspective, palm trees are not an ideal um, CO2 sink. They don't provide great shade canopy. So if you're looking at it purely from an environmental perspective, you know, palm trees are not contributing in ways other trees might. Um, that being said, I think Anne does have a, a very um, good point in that I think this one tree really sets an example for a larger issue. And that being that the city historically has removed more trees than it has planted, that there's been repeated issues with, you know, toy um, pines trees in the community, 
being taken down without proper notification or without proper explanation as to, is this a diseased tree? Is this merely an infrastructure issue? And I think there's, there's really two issues to look at. One is the community is not being informed um, in the correct manner or isn't given good explanation as to why certain trees are removed and what the process is. Two, the, the other issue is that there needs to be, for every tree that is removed, there needs to be explanation and a plan for replacing that tree with not just one tree, but possibly two or three trees. Yeah. The city has been talking for years about increasing shade canopy. Um, you know, we all know that the climate, climate change is real and we're facing, you know, a really a crisis in the near future in terms of global warming. So yes, may this palm tree be a historic tree? Possibly, is it potentially obstructing FAA flight paths? Potentially, but I think we need to keep the bigger issue in mind and that A, the city has not properly notified the community and that is not just the, the situation or the case in this situation. And two, th there, is, there needs to be a cohesive plan for replacing trees that are being removed. Thank you, Eva. Matt, you've had your hand raised. What would you like to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I raised my hand before Anne was speaking because I wanted to point out, it seems like, you know, this is coming down from the FAA and perhaps the city may be able to step in um, and try to redirect what the FAA is requiring. But, you know, ultimately the regulations are coming from the FAA. So a lot of the issue should be pointed towards these federal agencies um like I, I i totally get the frustration at the city for you know the kind of the role that they've played here or rather a lack of a like coherent communication role but i i think that needs to be you know kind of split apart you know what's the city's jurisdiction and what's the um federal aviation um it seems like that's been a big kind of point at least in some of the comments here that's getting kind of uh mixed up um and yeah, I, I had also wanted to ask, you know, like what, what species are these palm trees? Um, Washington, Washingtonia robusta. Okay, Tonia thanks. Robusta, okay. Cause yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted to point out, you know, what, what Ava was also just saying then it's, you know, in terms of the environmental uh, aspect, um, you know, palm trees aren't a great carbon sink, especially um, when you consider what in a native, like what kind of native vegetation can do in terms of sequestering uh, carbon compared to what invasive species can. Should, well, should, well, should these trees end up being removed? I'm, I'm not saying that's the ideal situation, but I'm saying if they end up being removed, this could be an opportunity to uh, have something still positive come from it in terms of what goes in and replaces some of these trees. So that's just one consideration I would like to toss out there. Yeah. Hey, native population. Well, if, nice. if you wouldn't, if you actually went native here, it'd be barren. You'd have we, no trees. We would not be. <laughs> we would not have. All right. Thank you. Are there any other comments right now? Any other inputs? Well, the, the thing is, is we the, the the report does come from FAA, the FAA, but the yeah. airport authority um, gets a hold of it. The airport authority. Um, hands it over to the city and between the city and the airport authority um they just um pin it off on each other of who has the report and who's going to give it to you and neither one of them will give it to you it's like the airport authority will say well the city has it the city will be like well the airport authority has it well one of you have it and can we get a copy yeah um, and you know it's like they're they're actually considering it uh, You're cutting out. Degrees. They are honestly considering us like idiots. Uh, they're not communicating. You know, there's doctors, lawyers, engineers up in this area. You know, I know telecommunication. I know nav air. I know all this stuff. I'm quite well versed in avionics and, you know, the metrology behind it, all the computations. 
but I need the data. I need the information, but they will not give it to me. I have a question, quick question. When you are looking at the trees, you know, during a foggy night and they're landing overhead towards the airport, how close are they to the- They don't even go over Newport Avenue. They go north of us. They're not even over Newport Avenue. They go, uh, I, I could sit in my backyard and they go over more like towards Voltaire Street and over even further than, you know, further than that. Do you think with the um, additional gates going into Terminal 1 that maybe they're anticipating that the flight path is going to be coming directly no. over there? No. Uh, basically, they're, they're saying about the, IL, the ILS system, and that's pretty much it. But that's all the information that we could obtain that it's about the ILS system. Is there another reasoning? I would love to know, but we can't. But we can't, we're not privy to that information. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So here we, you know, I just want to high level, just kind of go over everything. Um, you know, we have the neighbors here concerned. You know, the city is wanting to remove these trees. They've got the historical element because they were planted in 1909, 1910. The concern is that the rate of growth of 2.5 feet is in question as the current rate of the trees being over 100 years and the average rate, uh, the average height is about 66 feet. Um, and we're aware of a transition to a new radar system so that the tree removal would no longer be necessary. And then um, the issue of stump removal kind of blocks any future ability for palms to be, uh, for anything to be planted. And so there's, um, we know that that's very expensive and there's stump grinding. And, you know, the big issue that's been coming out of this is the lack of transparency and the lack of communication to, this, to the community by the city or the airport, whoever it may be. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see a potential of just kind of highlighting these issues as well as presenting to the city that we'd like to request the FAA's model as well so that we can educate ourselves on what that is, what the rate of growth is and what the standard is because there seems to be a lot of miscommunication um, about what it, what it is. For, and so we can't even reference that. And so what are the thoughts about sending, you know, putting up a letter, kind of highlighting the information, and then asking the city if they are transitioning to the new um, radar system that- Actually, uh, that it wouldn't be considered a radar system. Oh. Radar system is what they have. It would be a GPS system. Oh, yes, Instead sorry. of being ground-based, it's satellite-based. And does anyone know when that's expected to happen or is it just a tentative, it's, it's gonna happen? It was supposed to be 2019, but uh, for example, FedEx right now is using it as a system. Uh, basically, you can make the GPS system as your primary, the ILS system as your secondary, or you can go with a bunch of variations of that. But 2019 is when the FAA was supposed to tr start transitioning. Okay. System, which they you know, from I, what I... Sorry, Mandy, from what oh, I go heard, ahead, Tina. It, what I heard, it was 2022 now, supposedly. Okay. They changed the date, but that was only what I heard through um, just talking about what was going on with what they're talking with about. With everything? Mm -hmm. They're well, either, planning on it. Growth I mean, rate. Yeah. Growth okay. rate, if they said 2022 growth rate, there you go. So it would be a mute point also. So you got you to figure about when they're going to do it versus the growth rate. And so you can make it a mute point that this would not be a factor. Well, j just one point of uh, cl clarification. The, the ILS is the system that uh, runs into this 270 foot uh, interference. Was that, did I understand that correctly? Quote unquote, that's what they say, but the top uh, topography of this area, it has to be a line of sight. And if you look at where Newport is, 
4404 Newport in Venice. It's on top. And sure, the sure. airport's at an AGL of, I think, nine feet. So, so the j j just the question I had was, um, you were saying this would be a moot point for uh, if they transition to the GPS based, um, which makes sense to me. But right. if if they still have to rely on the ILS as a secondary, like that's their fail safe, you know, say there's something like a solar storm, like that may still be a priority for them. Like, do, do you know if there's uh, a second, uh, like an alternative well, yes. secondary? Uh, yeah, uh, GPS, and that's what I was saying, Eloran. Okay. But also, you can also have a very uh, high stability uh, VCXO on board, which you know, because your main correlation is time. That's going to be one of your main navigational points. But with the Eloran, if the GPS goes out at uh, what, 1.15 gig, you can go to the Eloran which the ELORAN is going to be a lower frequency and you're going to get back up through that. Okay. Thanks, ILS, thanks for clarifying. And, but the GPS systems right now uh, for like the commercial is, you know, it's already integrated through Boeing, by the way. Uh, but for your private aircraft, I think it's like $299. And it's way more accurate. It's like going from a black and white TV to a hologram. Even during foggy weather? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, the one thing I'd like to see is potentially, you know, I again, as I stated earlier, we cannot make a guarantee of anything what the city's trying to do, but that you brought some real concerns. And so I'm thinking what I'd like to ask is that we do draft up a letter kind of high level giving the um, history of that, the experience, um, the concerns of the community being that there's a lack of information, uh, miscommunication from the city and actively request the FAA's model so that we are aware of that standard. And that then in addition, um, I would like to um, raise the alarm of, you know, I, I and, and I'm aware of the lack of um, environmental benefit that palms do bring, but due to the um, history as well as the rate of growth that is in question, these trees um, are not matching the rate of growth that they're providing. And with that, um, if they do remove them and they just grind down or, or don't remove the stump, then it's just another, it's like a wooden, you know, a plug and there's no opportunity for another tree to be, re, you know, to be put in its place. And so the thought is to request the model, bring to light all of these issues and concerns of the community um, and the transition to the new uh, GPS system that's satellite based, um, which would negate the need to remove the trees. But then the concern is if they are not able to save the trees that they would either remove the stump and then work with the community to find trees that do provide canopy um, that you and your neighbors could potentially select as a replacement um, for your community. Um, and, and, and I hear what you're saying. I, I, I really do um, appreciate you coming to the board, but I, I'd like to make a motion for a letter with that information. And then from there, um, you know, we can, we can be made aware. It can really, it might not save these trees, but it could potentially save some trees in the future um, right. as we educate. Yes. Um, I just, um, I appreciate your time, everyone's time and everything like that. And I just want to make everyone aware that if, if again, if for some reason, you know, that it was a danger or anything, by no means do, do we, any of the neighbors here want to put anything mm -hmm. or any plane or anything in danger. Um, yeah. we, we, we just were asking for the reports and, and they, like I said, they did put an emergency clause on it, which is, silly to us due to the fact that um these trees you know th this report was done last a year ago or so you know so if it was an emergency last month why is it emergency from day to day or mm -hmm. if it was an emergency two months ago 
you know, the trees aren't growing, you know, so why are they such a rush to get them down? And like I said, we, we just want the information. We want to be able to go over the reports and their calculations. Mm -hmm. And and again, as, as you, you said, for them to be transparent, you know, on everything. Um, and again, you know, your consideration is greatly appreciated on this um, matter. Because um, like I said, we, we just want to see, see the information. All right. Well, I, I do appreciate you taking time. We do encourage, you know, participation and, you know, with your background and your, your excitement for the environment, I'd love to invite either one of you to potentially apply to be a, a community member on the board here, if that's something that you're interested in, um, to provide inputs as well for future issues. Um, but I'd like to make a motion. Um, to request that a letter be drafted to the city to provide high level just the what's going on um, and identify opportunities to um, request the FAA model, as well as um, the concerns, the rate of growth, you know, and the transition to the new radar system, as well as um, encourage that the city provide this information to the community. And if the trees, if the palms are removed, that they would remove the stumps so that there could be a tree um, planted there um, to replace what they remove. And that there would be um, a possible, you know, and another thing is to allow potentially for future uh, tree removals, allow the public some time to consider mm -hmm. the information or consider these changes or these, um, you know, trees that are, these palms that are being identified as removed, it would give the public enough time to, to look at the issue and potentially advocate if it is um, appropriate. And so um, I'd like to make that motion. Um, and if the city is not interested in replacing those trees in any capacity, um, you know, I'm part of a nonprofit called katestrees.org. We do provide native drought tolerant trees and we would be willing to help um, support the community um, with sourcing a tree that um, they would like to see in their community. And so it, again, it seems like a lot of these issues, it's really not, you know, again, there's that historical sentimental factor there, but a lot of this is just down to basic communication. Communications. Yeah. Exactly. Communication. And a lot of times when we don't look for those community inputs or, or allow the community enough time to provide those inputs, it creates scenarios like this where the community isn't feeling like they are being heard. And it does create confusion and it, you know, it, it escalates these situations. So again, while I can't make any guarantees, I do appreciate your advocacy. I understand the need and the concerns of the community. And I'd like to make that motion to support, um, to support the community and send it up to the board, uh, the main board next week um, mm. on a Thursday for the main board to consider. I'll second. Is there any discussion at this time? All right, with that, all in favor, raise your hand. All right, well, that was unanimous. It passes. So what I'm going to do, Tracy and John, I'm going to draft up a letter. Um, it's going to, um, I, I may need to talk to you about some of the information just to clarify the narrative, but um, oh, yeah. we will submit that for consideration at the next main board meeting, which will be held next Thursday. Oh, it starts at 6 p.m. You do have to pre-register to attend that meeting and that will come out. Typically he posts the agenda on Fridays. So um, either Friday or Monday, you should see an agenda on the PCPB website. And I'll be on the lookout for it anyways. And if I get it, I'll forward it on to you as okay, well. Because I know you. that um, this is a, you know, you, you really care about this. The other issue is, is when we do advocate for these um, issues, and like Eva stated, and, and you know, we are aware that um, not everyone has the same um, opinions about what, they'd like to see with those palms. 
-hmm. And um, and I've even heard comments to the to the effect of, oh, well, the palms, I wouldn't mind them being removed because, you know, every time there's rain or wind, you know, there's an element of, of them falling down and damaging uh, the property or, or pe people down below. Um, but again, um, if you want to um, invite your community members who are also passionate and concerned about that, if they can show up to this meeting and support when we do present, it does tend to um, they will they will to better supported Thursday. outcomes um, than they than they do if no one's showing up. So I just ask that you yeah. let your neighbors know or anyone who's concerned um, that we will be discussing this at our next meeting. Um, yes. And to let them come out and um, have their voice be heard. Okay, so so I'll be able to forward that email or whatnot. Yeah, what, it'll be link. in the form. It'll be like an agenda. I'll forward okay. it to you. And then the, okay. the link to register, it'll be in the agenda or they can just go to the PCPB website okay. and it'll be a link will be there for them to register as well. Okay. 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 All right. Well, we will be in touch. We're going to continue our meeting. You're more than welcome. And and thank you very much oh, yeah. for actually communicating with us. <laughs> hey, you know. Yeah. No, well, that was excellent. Well, well, that's something I know that we all, um, you know, struggle with and we could all use better mm. communication skills. And so we're just trying to find some solutions. We can't guarantee the outcome, but we do want you to know that we do hear you. We are listening and we wanted to provide you space to advocate for your issue. So thank you for attending. I do appreciate that. You're more than welcome to attend um, and stay on. Um, but if not, you can drop off at any time. We're going to go on to our next item on the agenda. And that is, um, hold on, let me pull up. The request um, to request proposed environmental improvements within the PCPB boundary from community members to advocate to the city for. And so, as I stated earlier, we do have a um, two new high school student liaisons that are working on the environmental subcommittee and they don't have the opportunity to vote. Um, they're not voting members, but um, we want to come up with a list of um, environmental issues or, or some ideas that you may have and, and create a list so that we can start addressing these issues here within our community. So Matt, you had shared a really good email um, and list. Would you be willing to share uh, your recommendations of possible items that could be um, advocated for uh, here in um, our community? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um... Although, do, do we want to open the floor to uh, uh, other folks first? Like you had just brought up our uh, high school liaisons. Oh, you know what? It looks like Tina has her hand raised. Oh, I didn't even see that. Sorry, it was camouflage. <laughs> oh, no, no. It, it, all right. it, it's all Actually, good. Sorry, I meant to take it back down. I, Matt, my I appreciate. Oh, no worries, Tina. Matt, I appreciate your graciousness. Caleb Thank and, you. and, and Anna, um, you, you have the floor. Did you have anything that you would like to share? Um, Caleb? Um, I think um, a thing that me and my, that my friends have been talking about recently is how the, at the climate summit actually recently, they set a goal to um, curb methane emissions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's actually a big goal. And I think it's very broad though, especially for San Diego, we, uh, here don't really have a lot of the, um, a lot of methane producing except other than okay. oil and other than with um, oil, oil pools and fracking. I think that that isn't really huge here, but I think it'll be definitely something to work on with big corporations and companies because they are really the big uh, producers for San Diego because we personally don't have too much fracking around the area. So I think maybe addressing like those big corporations that do have the ability to do something about their own emissions, um, because not necessarily the city itself is, is influencing, influencing that um, emission. Mm -hmm. That's a great suggestion. Anna? Yeah, I definitely agree with um, pushing for cleaner energy. I think I've seen a lot of neighbors, a lot of neighbors in our community, they 
have switched to solar and all that, but I think it's really the time to push for a more federal or government regulated sort of system for that. I think San Diego could definitely benefit from clean energy. And I think in places like schools is a great like location where you could really benefit from having clean energy systems. So I think that's something I would care about to discuss. Thank you. Those are really good. Eva, did you have your hand up? Um, no, um, I, well, yes and no. Okay, <laughs> you can go. Chat. It's, um, I, I totally agree with Caleb. And I wanted to just point out that um, actually landfills are one of the local methane producers that are of huge concerns. And we took this on in the environmental committee just before COVID, I think actually encouraging mm -hmm. the city to start including composting as part of their waste um, um, removal process to remove you know, organic matter mm -hmm. from local landfills. Again, the, the, the city was completely mum on the, the process or even the suggestion, and it is now taking a state mandate um, that mandates um, composting to, to address the issue. So I, I'm hopeful that with the state now requiring composting that we will be able to make some headway here locally um, in, in terms of removing organic matter from landfills, hence redu reducing those methane emissions. But you're absolutely right, Caleb. Um, you know, methane emissions is, is a huge contributor to um, um, to the climate climate crisis we're in. One of the, um, I would agree with Eva, we have been talking about that. Um, some of the <laughs> concepts is potentially um, asking to um, create a composting uh, program or a pilot program uh, that could potentially be started in our community. That was one of the ideas that we had suggested earlier. Um, another thing that had come up um, a few months ago at, a C at the CPC meeting, um, one of the code amendments for this last, um, for 2021 was to um, create a, um, depending, uh, Matt, can you clarify, is it based on the pedestrian miles traveled or the walkability that they wanted to eliminate drive-throughs oh. um, in oh. our communities? Can okay, so a, a, couple, a couple clarifications on that. Um, uh, so the, the proposed code amendment was for the uh, corridors that are designated as transit priority. Um, so, you know, the, the main corridors where you have like a lot of uh, bus lines or they might be, you know, like trying to also prioritize walkability and bikeability because that's how you can get from, you know, wherever it is you need to go to the bus lines um, to try to make it more efficient for the traffic and to make it safer for pedestrians. They're proposing a ban on new uh, drive throughs not affecting currently existing drive throughs but a ban on new ones. Um, and so what I heard was that there's been a fair amount of pushback. People, you know, get really concerned about this, but uh, like it, it sounded like the central planning group uh, was, was not really in support of it. But to me, this idea sounds really promising because uh, it, it can address a few different uh, kind of problems at once. Like, um, you know, in, in trying to prioritize and elevate transit and walkability options to do things that can make it easier or at least be incentivized to get out of cars, um, I, I think are all a net benefit as, you know, c c transportation is one of our largest uh, sectors in terms of contributions of greenhouse gases. Um, so anything we can do to decarbonize it rapidly is I think a step in the right direction. Um, and so if, you know, like from the transportation committee, uh, we, we have, you know, periodically people bring up, oh, what about the traffic backing up from the Better Buzz drive-through? Mm -hmm. um, I forget what, what street that is, um, but Hugo. it's, you know. It's Hugo. It, it, thank you, Hugo, you know, just a block, uh, within a block of Rosecrans, you know, so basically if we were to not allow new drive-throughs, problems like that just wouldn't appear in new construction. So it would, you know, be a way to address several of these, both safety on one hand and potentially, um, you know, carbon emissions on another. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Angela, I think, did, did you have your hand raised? Yes, I wanted to go back to something that Anna was talking about and um, solar energy. One thing that you know, my youngest daughter was really involved in and still is in clean energy. And 
one of the lectures that I joined in that she was, you know, talking with and on was about finding kids to advocate for solar in schools and that there aren't enough, you know, young adults, students that are helping to do that. So that is something that I can give you some information on because look at Point Loma High School. Are, do they have any plans to put solar? Go ahead, Anna. Uh, I remember offhandedly one of my teachers did mention during the construction in a few months with the, the par parking lot, they wanted to put solar panels over the parking lot, but I don't think they have like any um, plans to fully switch to some sort of clean energy. Well, from what I, from what I was gathering from one of the speakers is that there was only three schools in San Diego that were trying to go solar and that it really needs, they need younger people to advocate for that. So I can give you some information in case that's something you're interested in. Another thing I thought would be an opportunity with, since we're talking about schools is, um, you know, the age, uh, maybe if the high school uh, would limit the ability to drive to and from campus uh, just to seniors or to a certain age, uh, an age should limit the amount of drivers and really encourage kids to walk or bike to work. Um, but, you know, limiting the amount of um, teenage drivers or, or, you know, the amount of cars going to and from the school um, that's just another recommendation I had. Um, and then back to the uh, drive-throughs, seeing if there's some other um, ideas with regard to requiring the, you know, the car to auto turn off, you know, turn off the car if you're waiting or in line so that it's just not sitting there um, with carbon, you know, emitting there while you're in the drive-through. But um, I definitely would like to, uh, I really like all the suggestions that are being made tonight. Eva? Um, I, I, I have another um, potential issue I wanted to, to um, bring to everyone's attention. And I think it is becoming more of an issue now with increasing densities, ADUs that don't require a designated parking space, um, street sweeping. Um, I live in the Roswell area of Point Loma and the majority of streets don't have designated signs as to when street sweeping takes place. So cars are generally parked on both sides of the, of the street and the street sweeping machine has to sort of dodge cars um, and isn't effectively sweeping the streets, which might sound like a minor nuisance. The, the issue that does um, raise though is if it, on the rare occasion we do get rain here, everything that remains on the streets automatically becomes runoff. And that's, you know, anything from, trash, plastic bags, batteries, toxic items that really do not belong in storm drains and, and should not end up in the ocean. Um, as much as I loathe, um, you know, this, this explosion of signs, I do think there needs to be um, a way to designate street sweeping days and enforce parking regulations on those days um, so street sweeping can take place effectively. Um, and, and hence avoiding, you know, a lot of these items ending up in the ocean. You know, having a, getting cars towed or giving tickets on those people that do not um, move their car during street sweeping, look at all the revenue that the city could make mm -hmm. <laughs> because I see it all the time. Yeah. And they just, I know there's people out there that's willing, you know, that can do the work and write the tickets. <clears throat> and, you know, it's heavily enforced in other parts of the city during last year when, you know, th there was no school. We had a pod um, with my kids and a, a couple of other families. And one of those families lived in, um, in the Hillcrest, well, actually South Park area. And pod was at their house on, on Tuesdays. And we knew that you know, first Tuesday of the month, if, even if we just stopped to let our kids out of the car to run up to their house, we immediately got a ticket. I mean, there was a, a meter maid literally sitting on every street corner giving tickets to cars that were even briefly stopping to, to unload passengers. Um, so it's, it's 
the city is enforcing it in other neighborhoods. There just seems to be complete lack of enforcement or so even notification. I looked at the city website and I cannot even see a posted schedule as to when street sweeping days are here and, and uh, locally. Um, the data, it, it, it's, the calendar is not publicly available, it seems. I 100% concur with you, Eva, because I know in North Park Pacific Beach and um, I think it's Hillcrest area, mm -hmm. they actively give tickets or tow your car if it's there mm -hmm. even two hours. Um, and even Mission, I'm sorry, uh, Mission Hills area, mm -hmm. uh, not Mission Hills area. I don't really know about Mission Beach, but I know those areas are getting ticketed immediately the same mm -hmm. day. And they have signs though. I know you don't like signage and yeah. nor, nor do we really want extra signages, but they do have signs. Don't park on this street, on mm -hmm. this side, you know, on certain days and on the other day, you can just park on the other side of the street. Right. But they have penalties. And I, I think here we're not getting the penalties. So people are not adhering to it. Mm -hmm. How can we enforce it? I mean, how, what do we need to do? And you know, Mandy, going back to what you were talking about, about biking to school, you know, mm -hmm. lim limiting, we have that bike to work. Isn't there a bike to work day or, or mm -hmm. something? Yeah. It would be yeah, fun right. if the school did, you know, bike to school day once a month and oh, have some cool. type of, um, every kid that does gets entered into, you know, some drawing and then there's a prize. Yeah. And, we, and see we got, how much, you know, how much that would decrease. It's just like not having one meal, meat meal a week, how much methane gas that mm -hmm. would lessen if people just gave up. That's a great idea. One mm -hmm. meal, one meat. I like that a lot. Um, we, um, Angela, we, we went to visit family in Germany this summer and I met um, a family at a playground there that had just moved from France to Germany. And in Germany, it's very common that kids, parents aren't actually allowed to bring your kids to school past first or second grade. Kids are encouraged to be independent. You bike or you walk. And this family met at a playground there told me about a program in France where they had just recently moved from, instead of a school bus, they have quote unquote a bike bus. So there's several designated adults that bicycle a certain route through the community and pick up kids at these designated bike stops and they all bike to school collectively um, with you know a, a couple of adults there for each bike bus to guide them safely to school. You know, Eva, actually we used to have that and Nicole ran that for a long time. Really? That's awesome. She did it when her kids were in elementary school and mm -hmm. um, Dana going, um, and then I think even to Korea, she would um, do that because I think she comes from OB she would actually have a bike train and mm -hmm. um, That's she, was awesome. she, um, she did that right before the pandemic. We actually established that at Ocean Beach Elementary as well with Nicole's help. And um, it was kind of the same concept of, you know, uh, if you wanted to, we would pick you up along the path. Um, you know, the issue is though of safety and, you know, having a big group of kids out there would definitely be a traffic calming <laughs> measure and it would probably uh, encourage the community to want to slow down um, for that but I think that's something that let's um Caleb and Anna would that be something you would like to maybe reach out to Kelly and the principal the administrator and see if we can get a meeting to see if the school um would be interested in supporting something along that lines because I think you know um with Nicole and even Matt, you know, they, they're part of several different organizations that are very bike friendly. And I bet if we were to reach out, you know, for those like grand <laughs> prizes, I'm sure they would be more than happy to help support um, the, these teens, you know, who are wanting to get out on their bikes and stuff. And so we could incentivize them. I think that's the big thing missing in all of the policies with like <laughs> transit with the city in general is just that they're not really incentivizing people to get out of the car, you know, whether it's, you know, simple with kids, like, Hey, something tangible that they can earn. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I definitely see that as an opportunity. So, but Mandy, some of the kids have too many stuff that they're carrying. They don't want to bike necessarily. So they could walk, could be in that walking in slash biking instead yeah, of two. Exactly. It doesn't so, necessarily need to be biking. It just needs to be. Um, no car. Out, no car. Uh, if you don't utilize a car, 
going to and from school, you would qualify to participate right. in that. No motorized. <laughs> yeah. And just think of the mental health benefit of just yeah. exercise and fresh air, especially in the midst of a pandemic we're in. Yeah, we've got, these are all great suggestions. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to do is, you know, we were talking about the palms earlier, but um, uh, tree planting. And I'd like to present, um, I can ask, I'd like to present at our next meeting um, about uh, basically the tree policies right now and the um, high level just kind of um, about Kate's trees, but also about the city um, and their tree maintenance uh, program right now and the deficits there. And um, just encourage everyone to provide inputs and to advocate um, for the climate action plan that's going to um, be up for consideration and you know, provide inputs and advocate for uh, trees within that climate action plan. Cause like um, Angela had stated earlier, Eva, I'm not sure who, but with the ADUs and people um, building, you know, with the setbacks um, on private property, we're kind of removing um, some of our tree supply um, and, we need to not be active, you know, we need to have policy that doesn't encourage um, concrete jungles in a sense. And we need to expand our urban forestry department as well to, um, to appropriately address the, the concerns that our, our city has and as the needs of the trees that we currently have. Um, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to follow up. Um... The, 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 the comments that Anna and Caleb had made, um, I, I think there's a tie in some of what you're talking about, Mandy, with, um, you know, a, a Anna brought up uh, the idea of clean energy and something like transitioning to solar. Uh, the, there, there are some other interesting things you can look at in terms of rooftops, um, uh, as opposed to just solar, like uh, green roofs, in terms of trying to reduce things like uh, some of our urban heat uh, effect. If you have a green roof, it can help with some of the cooling of the building underneath, as well as providing a little bit mm -hmm. of carbon offset. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know, given, you know, kind of the situation of water in this region, whether green roofs make as much sense here as they do in some other parts. But that that's one other thing to think about, especially when, you know, we're talking about what can we kind of do in our local community. Well, to the extent that we have the ears of developers and planners who come before our board, we might be able to help, if not straight up advocate for some of these ideas like rooftop solar or green energy, maybe we can at least plant the seed. Like, I, I, I don't know if anyone on the board here is in the long, uh, uh, in project review, but you know, what if we just like, you know, frame questions to people bringing projects like, oh, are you gonna go with solar or a green roof? You know, don't, you know, put, pose them a question that would force them to address something like that. Um, and then uh, w one last thing I wanted to say in response to what Caleb had brought up, uh, in terms of methane, you know, we, we don't have a lot of methane producers here, but we do have a lot of methane consumption in the form of natural gas. Um, and so also looking at this kind of on the level of planning, both in our community and city, um, some communities like I, I know when I was still up in the Bay Area, Berkeley um, had basically done away with any new methane, uh, new, any new um, natural mm -hmm. gas lines for any new construction. Um, as a way to try to reduce things like uh, if, if we start reducing the demand, there will presumably be less production or extraction of it. But I mean, yeah, that, that is a hard one to kind of try to mm -hmm. attack from just the demand side. Um, but yeah, thanks. Just wanted to throw that out there. Great, great suggestions, Matt. Thank you. Oh, Eva, I, go ahead. I think Encinitas was actually, um, I don't know if it has passed the city council, if they're considering it, um, requiring that new construction um, no longer include um, gas stove or gas stoves or gas fireplaces or you know any gas, um, any appliances running on gas, like dryers. Um, so there is a movement here in Southern California to push that forward as well. You know, another thing too, Mandy, is you know how there is this with wetlands, you know, about the Famosa, if they have to, if they destroy one, you know, acre of wetlands somewhere, they have to, to mitigate, it has to 
require two acres somewhere else. Why can't they do that with trees? If you have to take down one tree, then you have to plant two trees in the same area somewhere. That's part of, um, you know, one of the things that we're working with on the Kate's Trees Group is an advocacy piece to um, create like a rate of if the tree does, um, you know, is removed by the city that there is a standard that's created about the mitigation. Um, some of the uh, suggestions that are coming up is like a TIF, a, a tree impact fund that um, can be funded for trees maybe, or, you know, there would be a fee if a tree does have to be removed, that there would be a fund um, established where monies would be um, paid, you know, for that, for that fee, you know, as well as um, increasing if the city does have to remove a tree to replace it with two to three um, trees per that one tree, because we are in a deficit as well. Um, so that's a great recommendation. Thank you. Anna? Um, this is going back to what Matt was mentioning uh, about green roofs. I remember a few years ago for an assignment in school, we had to think of like a solution for, or just like something you could do to help your um, local environment. And I remember I wrote about how you could plant milkweed on buildings to help the monarch butter, butterfly populations. So I think there's definitely, just like adding on to that, there's definitely a lot of room to not only help with carbon, but also to help a lot of species around here. That's a great suggestion. And I like the idea that it's on the rooftop. A lot of people don't know milkweed is very toxic and poisonous to humans. So, you know, being out, you know, away from, you know, just along the street, that's, you know, it eliminates the opportunity for um, toxicity, you know, with people, with those plants. Um, any other recommendations that you'd like to see I know I had it as an action item and we can definitely add, but in the traffic and transportation subcommittee meeting, we've created what's um, could, like an Excel spreadsheet basically of action items. And what I'd like to do is um, from this meeting, um, let's go ahead and take all the recommendations, you know, I'll do the notes and we'll create an Excel spreadsheet that very much mirrors and it lists each item of what we'd like to see change. And then once uh, at the, our next meeting, what we can do is we can go through and add additional ones. And at the end, we can go through it and rank them. And then maybe we can, um, out of that, um, you know, we can prioritize the top five or, or top three that we'd like to address. And, and of that list, um, I'd like, you both to select one uh, of those items to address and we can start um, working with you to create a um, recommendation that we can move up to the board. Um, does everyone seem to be in agreement with that process? And then we can um, start you know, addressing them line by line because we have so many awesome ideas and I know we're not gonna be able to get all of them, but you know, it really just to keep them on our radar so that we don't forget about them and that we kind of have a, hey, we're all in agreement. This is a priority. This is what we'd like to see changed. So um, I like that. Um, so right now it's 6.53, it's getting late. Um, we don't, I know I listed it as an action item, um, but we've got a plan. So at our next meeting, um, I'd like to know your thoughts. Um, I know we had met a month prior, but we have the holidays coming up and I know that's a busy time for a lot of people. Um, the thought is, I mean, we could meet in December if, if, if everyone is interested in, um, that would be the second, um, the second uh, Wednesday of the month and that would be December 8th. Um, Oh, actually, um, actually, no, I, I won't be able to. I have actually something. Can we wait till January then? I'm thinking mm -hmm. just with the holidays. And then our next meeting will be January 12th, 2022. Um, same time, it's a Wednesday. Does that work for everyone's schedule? And then when we come mm -hmm. back to that meeting, um, 
I'd like to do a presentation on trees and just kind of the urban forestry and opportunities for us to advocate for that. And then I'd also um, like any, you know, you're all welcome to, if you have someone you know, or you'd like to present on an item, you are all um, welcome to um, ask or, or bring that to the agenda. I, I'm very uh, supportive of that, but um, we'll meet and we'll kind of go through our list, add additional items and then rank them. And then we can go from there as far as um, what we'd like to address. Um, so I really wanna thank you all for your time. Thank you, Anne, for joining us. Um, Anne and Mandy, I were- Mandy, what? can I just clarify? Oh, sure. So. Um, could Anna and Caleb, are they going to see this spreadsheet before the vacation or can they just decide something meanwhile on their own? I just wanted to clarify just for this. No, that's a good idea. You know, actually, let me, re that's a good idea. How about this? How about I, I'm going to do the meeting minutes from the recording. We'll create the list. And then mm -hmm. from what we have, um, we have quite a bit, you know, how about you um, just talk amongst yourselves for, and, and come up from that list. I'll share it with Yes. Why don't we make it a shareable like Google Doc? And we can yes, all it'll be it. on a drive. We'll all have access yeah. to it. We can all view it. We can all modify it together. Um, and I'll invite everyone to that. Um, uh, that's basically what we do with the traffic and transportation. But then mm -hmm. um, everyone can see it. And then you can talk amongst yourselves and make that determination of what you would like to uh, work on. Together. Yeah, and that way then they have a decision to do and have time and if they want yeah, to do Yeah, I would it. agree. Thank you, Tina. That makes sense. And so that'll give you some time to think about what your approach is and what you'd like to see um, or the course of action that needs to be made to the city. But in the meantime, um, you know uh, that you can always reach out to us. So even though we're not going to have a meeting in two months, if you guys get the list and you come up with an idea, feel free to reach out to Eva and I sooner than later so that we can start um, supporting you with that, with that quest. All right. Well, everyone, I want to thank you all. We're going to call the meeting. It is 6.57 p.m. You all have a great evening. Mandy, stay on a sec, okay? I wanted to okay. talk to you about something else. All right. We've got to stop.